Hello, and welcome back to Chemistry Corner. I'm still your host, Mr. Sellers. Um, so, we're entering day two of e-learning. I believe this is day four of social distancing for us. Um, I just want to give you a quick update on the spread of that coronavirus before we begin our lesson today. Um, as of the time that I am shooting this video, we've had zero deaths in Indiana due to the COVID-19. Um, that may have changed by the time that you watch this video, but as of right now, we're at zero. We are at over 20 confirmed cases of the coronavirus, though. Um, but that could be a little bit deceptive because the United States is not the best, uh, we're not the leaders in testing right now, so there could be many more cases that are just not confirmed, they haven't been tested yet. Um, it's important that we're taking this social distancing seriously uh, and that we're looking out for others in our community. Just because you're not in a vulnerable group doesn't mean that you don't have a responsibility to stop the spread of this virus. All right, enough of that. Um, let's talk about today's lesson and what we're gonna be doing. Yesterday, um, we looked at ionic compounds and how to balance ionic compounds. I showed you that crisscross method. Um, and then today, we're gonna be talking a little bit about the nomenclature of ionic compounds. So, yesterday, we had that set of 20 compounds, and I gave you the ions, and you balanced them into ionic compounds. Your assignment for today is going to be to take those 20 compounds um, and come up with names for them, the nomenclature for those 20 chemicals. So we're going to be going from a formula, and in the next column, we're going to be writing the 20 names um, for those chemical compounds that you came up with yesterday. I think we're ready to do it. Let's go. Okay, so ionic nomenclature. Um, remember that nomenclature is a system of naming. And this system of naming needs to be specific enough that we can tell the composition, what it's composed of, what it's made of, and the structure, how it's put together. So just looking at these three examples to start us off here. KBR, we know that this is potassium bromide. And this name is specific enough. It tells me what the composition is. It's composed of potassium, K, and bromine, Br. And it's also specific enough to tell me the structure. Because it says potassium bromide, I know that this is an ionic structure. I know that it's going to be two ions um, that are attracted together because they're opposite charges. We talked about that yesterday. Um, if this had been potassium monobromide, if I had put a mono prefix right here, that would have indicated that this is a covalent compound, that it's not the opposite charges that are holding it together, but rather these shared electrons. It doesn't say monobromide. It just says bromide, so I know it's ionic. This next one, calcium chloride. I know it's got calcium. I know it's got chlorine, there's my composition. It doesn't say dichloride, so I know it's ionic. Now, this name, this nomenclature, is specific enough to get to this formula. It doesn't say anything about there being two chlorines here, but I know that there have to be two chlorines in order to balance those opposite charges. That's like what we looked at yesterday. Calcium has a common oxidation state of plus 2. Each chlorine has a common oxidation state of minus 1. So to balance them out, I'm going to need two chlorines, calcium chloride. And then this last one here, this is what we're working our way towards, um, the hardest type ones. Iron 3 hydroxide. This name, I had to be a little bit more specific with this one. I said iron 3 I didn't include those Roman numerals up here. The reason that I've got to put that three in there is because iron is a transition metal. It has a variable charge. It could be iron plus two, iron plus three. There are lots of possibilities. So I have to be specific about it. This is iron three. 
iron with a plus three charge. And I'm balancing that charge against hydroxide ions. Hydroxide ions are OH. They have a charge of minus one. So to get that minus one to cancel out against a positive three, I need three hydroxides. If I've got three hydroxides, that'll be enough to cancel out the positive charge uh, from that iron ion. So in the next little bit, we're gonna start with our easiest type ones, binary ionic compounds. All right, so really quickly here, um, this is some vocab that I want us to know and I want us to be comfortable with. The difference between a cation and an anion. So we can see that both of these words contain the vocab word ion. It's because they're different types of ions. A cation is a positively charged ion, and an anion is a negatively charged ion. One easy way to remember that, um, cation has a T in it. I like to take that T and make it look like a positive charge here. Um, that's one way that I can remember that the cations are the positive ones and the anions are the negative ones. This is the attractive force in an ionic bond. This is how ionic compounds are able to hold themselves together. It's from the canceling out of this positive and negative charge. It is just like a magnet, a little tiny, tiny magnet. So our easiest type, the simple binary compounds. Um, binary meaning two, and then compounds meaning that they have more than one element in them. Uh, we'll have to be able to do both. We need to go from a formula to a name. We also need to be able to go from a name to a formula, even though that's not something that I'm testing on your assignment for today. Um, so looking at these, I think that most of us would be able to name these um, just from sight, but I still want to walk through them. This first one, Ki. My cation is potassium. Potassium generally has a charge of plus one. So for my cation, I can put potassium. And then for my anion, my anion this time is iodine. Um, but when I'm naming these ionic compounds, I don't end in I-N-E, iodine. I'm gonna change that to I-D-E, iodide. So this Ki is potassium iodide. Potassium iodide. There's our first one. This next one, my cation is magnesium and my anion is chlorine. It says chloride, but that's just because it's a compound. They're bonded together. So magnesium chloride. When I'm going from a name to a formula, the best thing to do is to start by writing out your ions. We already said these. Magnesium is my cation. I know that magnesium ions look like this. Common oxidation state for magnesium is plus two. And then chlorine. I know that chlorine ions look like this. Common oxidation state of negative one. These don't balance out right away. Positive two and negative one, I end up with some leftover charge. In order to make these cancel out, I need to have two chlorine ions. If I've got two ions of chlorine, that'll be enough to cancel out with one ion of magnesium. So how would I write this as a formula? Mg, Co, two. One mistake that I've been seeing a lot um, is that people have been including charges in their um, uh, balanced compound. So I've got, been getting some people that have been giving me things like this. They take one magnesium and one chlorine, put them together, and then they just include that leftover charge in their compound. This is not really a balanced compound. This is still an ion. It's an ion because it's a charged particle. I'm not trying to get to bigger ions. I'm trying to get to compounds, balanced um, ionic compounds. 
So this, not going to work for me. We need to balance it. We need to show that there are two chlorines in order to cancel out that charge. And then this last one here. Aluminum is my cation. Oxygen is my anion. But I'm going to end it in IDE. Aluminum oxide. So aluminum. Aluminum oxide. I don't have to say anything about two aluminums. I don't have to say anything about three oxygens. Aluminum and oxygen will always bond this way um, to make aluminum oxide. I don't have to say it's dialuminum trioxide. I don't have to say it's aluminum three oxide. None of that stuff. This is just aluminum oxide. It'll only balance in this one specific way. So this is specific enough. Now let's see what happens when we start throwing in those variable charges, those uh, Roman numerals. I know that this is sometimes where we start to make mistakes. Okay, our next set here, uh, looking at the variable oxidation states. Um, I don't have a periodic table handy, but remember that the variable oxidation states, they tend to happen with the transition metals, those metals that are right there in the middle of the periodic table. There are also a few other metals that'll have variable oxidation states. The most common ones are tin and lead, which you'll find on the right side of your periodic table past the transition metals. So it's mostly the transition metals that have variable oxidation states. It's also a few other metals, but it's also not all of the transition metals that have variable oxidation states. Excuse me. Remember, we took the time to write out these common oxidation states on our periodic table. So some of these ones like uh, cadmium and silver and zinc, they have common oxidation states. But then some of them like nickel or iron or copper, those ones are going to have variable oxidation states. And that's what I'm talking about in this section. Let's get into it. This first one. Um, NiCl2. So always a good idea is to think about what are my ions here, what's my cation, what's my anion. I know that my cation is nickel. I know it's going to be a nickel compound. And I know that my anion is chlorine. If I think about the charges of these ions, for chlorine I'm going to go with the common oxidation state, negative one. But I don't know what the oxidation state for nickel is going to be. At least not right off the bat, I don't. Nickel is one of those ones that can vary. It's got a variable charge, a variable oxidation state. So how do I figure it out? How do I solve that variable? Well, it's all about balancing the charges again. I know I've got two chlorines. So why don't I draw that? Two chlorines. That would look just like this. And I have to think to myself, how can I cancel out that leftover charge? How can I take this negative 2 and balance it with only one nickel ion? Well, to cancel that negative 2, this nickel must be positive 2. It's a little hard to see there. It's my best at a 2. So, the way that I would name this, I name the cation first. Nickel 2. That's the name of this cation, nickel 2. Then I can name the anion, chloride. So this name is nickel 2. Remember, this Roman numeral, this 2, is part of the cation. This cation is nickel 2. Nickel 2, chloride. That's where the Roman numeral is coming from. It is an oxidation state of the cation. It doesn't have anything to do with these subscripts. Or it does, but only because we're canceling out that charge. But the Roman numeral doesn't come from the subscript. The Roman numeral comes from the oxidation state. Let's try another one. Iron and oxygen. 
easiest way is going to be to draw out these ions. It says I have two irons. I'll draw two Fe's. I don't know what those charges are off the bat. I can give it a variable. I'm just going to draw question marks. And then it says that I have three oxygens. So I'm going to draw three oxygen ions. Oh, oh, oh. I do know what these charges are because oxygen, remember it's so electronegative, it's always going to get its octet. It's always going to steal two electrons. Negative two. Boop, 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 boop. So these are the ions that I'm looking at. I do still have an unknown here. I've got this variable charge, this variable oxidation state. I'm going to figure that out by doing a little balancing. Three oxygens at negative two, that's negative six. So I've got negative six here. I'm going to cancel that negative six with a positive six. But this time, that positive six charge is divided between two ions. In my first example, I knew I needed to cancel with positive two. I only had one ion. That ion was positive two. This time, I'm canceling with a positive six divided between two ions. So positive six divided by two. Each one of these is iron three. If they're both iron three, that'll get me to positive six. So the way I would name this one, iron three, iron three, iron three, oxide. Iron three oxide. The Roman numerals come from the oxidation state. It does not come from the subscript. It is the oxidation state of the metal, the cation. All right, and then this last one. Going from a name to a uh, formula. Again, let's break it into the ions. It says I've got copper one. I can draw copper one. Copper one. Copper with a plus one. And then bromide, I know that that's bromine, which has a common oxidation state of minus one. Positive one negative one. These charges already cancel out. So to make this formula, I'm just going to bond them together. I'm not going to leave any space. Cu Br. Cu Br. This is copper one bromide. And you got to be careful going back the other way. If I gave you this, you can't just tell me that it's copper bromide. That's true, it is copper bromide, but that's not specific enough. You've got to tell me that this is copper one bromide. Copper one bromide. All right, we just have one more section to go, and that's when we're going to start throwing in these polyatomic ions. Polyatomic, many atoms. All right, home stretch here, guys. Last set. Thank you for making it this far into the video. Um, the polyatomic ions, polyatomic, many atoms. So these are just ions that contain many atoms. We treat these ions as though they were one particle. It's a particle that's made up of many atoms, but we're going to treat it like it's one particle that moves around together. Let me show you what I mean. This first one here, sodium acetate. I think always the best strategy is to break it up into the ions. So I can draw these ions. Sodium. I know that that's Na. I know it's going to have a plus one charge. I got the charge from the common oxidation state. And then this other one, it says acetate. You're not going to find acetate on the front side of the periodic table. It's not an element. Acetate is a polyatomic ion. We took the time to write these on the back side of our periodic table. So I would have to look it up if I didn't already know it, and I would find out that acetate is C2H3O2 with a negative one charge. That is seven atoms. Two carbons, three hydrogens, two oxygens. Seven atoms 
that move around as though they were one particle. It's a polyatomic ion. This negative one charge applies to the entire molecule. The entire particle has a negative one charge. It doesn't belong on any one of these elements because uh, we treat them like they're a group now. It's a polyatomic group. If I look at the charges between my cation and my anion, I can see that these already cancel out, a positive one and a negative one. So sodium acetate, my formula, is just going to be the two of them put together. It looks like nacho. NaC2H3O2. I've got sodium, and then I've got the acetate ion, sodium acetate. Looking at another one. This is more similar to what you'll be doing on this set tonight. Um, NH4 in parentheses, 2, S. Ooh. First, let's break it up into the ions. This one in parentheses here, because it was put into parentheses, I know that it moves around as one particle. I know that it's going to be polyatomic. So I'm going to draw that by itself. NH4. I still include this 4. That subscript of 4 is inside the parentheses. It is part of the polyatomic. Um, I would probably need to look that up if I didn't know it. NH4 is going to be ammonium, and it's got a plus 1 charge. And then my other ion here, my anion, is sulfur, or sulfide. And I know it has a negative 2 charge. Now I can see why I've got this extra subscript in there, that subscript of 2. I need 2 ammoniums, 2 ammoniums, to cancel out the charge from the sulfur. Positive 2 from my cations negative 2 from my anion. Looking for a name though, the name for this one is actually really not bad. I say the cation first. Ammonium. Ammonium. I say the anion second, and I end it in IDE. Instead of sulfur, I'm going to say sulfide. Ammonium sulfide. That is my name. It's specific enough. It's got everything I need. It doesn't say anything about this subscript of 2. But remember, I don't need to be that specific. Ammonium and sulfur are only going to bond in this way. There is no other way that I could bond ammonium and sulfur together to get all the charge to cancel out. So just saying ammonium sulfide is enough. There's only one possibility for ammonium sulfide. Last one here, here we go. Cu, OH in parentheses, 2. Let's take a quick look at what these ions might look like. Cu, I know that's copper. OH, it's in parentheses, so it must be a polyatomic. It's moving around together. I could look for the charges for these two things. Copper. This is going to be a variable charge. We talked about that on the last segment. So I'm going to put a question mark. I don't know what that charge is yet. OH. If I look that up on the back side of my periodic table, I'm going to see that that's hydroxide, and hydroxide has a charge of minus 1. Uh, it also says that I've got two of these hydroxides. I'll go ahead and draw that. The last thing that I need to figure out is that copper. Remember we said we didn't, we didn't really know what that oxidation state on the copper was going to be. Well, I can figure it out though with a little algebra. Two hydroxides, that's negative two. I'm going to cancel that negative two with a positive two to get to zero. So this copper, this has got to be copper plus two. If I'm writing a name, I'll say the cation first. Copper, 2. Copper, 2. Copper, 2. Hydroxide is my anion. 
copper to hydroxide. So when we're doing this nomenclature, there's a few things to keep in mind. Does your element have a variable charge, like copper? These are going to be the transition metals. It might also be tin or lead. And then you also have to look out for things that are in parentheses. These are our polyatomic ions. They move around like one particle, um, and we say the full name for those acetate, ammonium, hydroxide, and all those other ones that are on the back side of your periodic table. So your assignment for today is to take those 20 compounds that you've already balanced, come up with names for those compounds, the nomenclature for those compounds. Um, and then tomorrow, we're going to be talking about oxidation states and how do we solve the oxidation states of these compounds and of the elements inside these compounds. That's going to be it for today. Um, please know that you can always reach out to me uh, if you need chemistry help, but also just if you, you know, for any reason. Um, I know that this can feel like a time when we're very isolated. Um, maybe being at home is not the best environment for you, um, and you're stuck there for an extended amount of time. Um, just know that you can reach out to me or really any of your teachers um, at Martinsville High School, we're here for you, we're here to help you, um, even from a distance. So stay safe out there, Artesians. Uh, definitely email me or reach out through Google Classroom um, if you need help in any way. Have a good one.